Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, my uh, new series of lectures I call Critical Thinking Skills or Thinking 101. My name is Nazim, Nazim Abdullayev, and I hope to see more of you on this channel later on. Yeah. But I uh, hope you like what I'm going to tell you, and I hope we'll meet again. So what I'll do is I'll talk about thinking and uh, thinking skills. Well, it's a sort of a thing that you say, well, why do I need to learn about thinking? You know, I think anyway, but that's not exactly true. You know, we live in a time of flux. It's a time of incredible change, time of innovation and transformation. Some of it's bad, some of it's good, but it's, it's basically a time for you to get good at change. And you know, you have to think your, uh, move your brain a little bit, yeah. In, in a different direction maybe that you haven't expected. But mostly what I'll try to tell you is uh, how to use your critical thinking skills better in, to navigate your everyday life and hopefully in application uh, to your other activities in business, science, or anywhere else you want to do it. I'm going to talk about uh, introduction today a little bit on, on what is critical thinking why you need to learn it and some basics uh, behind scientific method uh, which is sort of the basis for critical thinking we'll talk about many things in in the series of lectures but uh, today let's talk about the introduction uh, I hope you like uh, the uh, things I'm going to talk to you about and we'll come back to it so do you want to learn it? If you learn it, please uh, listen and sign up and uh, hope uh, I'll be with you on the journey. Humans are the first animals to uh, apply thinking um, to create uh, and innovate. Never before it happened. Um, of course, the animals do cooperate. Of course, animals create things. You know, just think about the termite mounds. Yeah, it is a supreme uh, creation, but it's a creation of nature. It's sort of a bottoms-up thing. You know, it's a great palaces are created. But think also about, you know, our mosques and churches and uh, cathedrals and stadiums, and they're all made by an intelligent designer who is a human. And human mind creates it uh, both through uh, um, an application of knowledge and wisdom and also through the cooperation. Humans are absolutely unique. And uh, the size of the population of the world is actually shows that, you know, that sort of thinking capacity of humans increased from, you know, when you probably had a few million people uh, in the past. And that sort of created its own, you know, uh, unique revolution. The first revolution to be created was, of course, the uh, agricultural one, followed by the industrial and this uh, century alone, a computer one. And uh, we're entering on a fourth one, which is the revolution of uh, cognitive computing and, you know, and data. But, you know, the human's overall brain capacity hasn't changed, you know. We are still the same race, but it's, you know, seven, eight billion of us, and we just uh, create and apply our creations in uh, more increasing quantity. So, but we also didn't uh, increase in quality only, we also increased in, uh, sorry, not increased in, 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 in quantity, but also in quality. Just think uh, the graph on the left is the amount of the manuscripts published. Uh, through medieval times, um, you know, starting from very little, down to probably five million different manuscripts. I think it's uh, five, five, five million um, here in 15th century, and that's only Europe alone. I'm sure there was, you know, a lot more in China and India, and of course Europe led the way. But everybody's catching up. And if you look at the amount of book titles published, so it goes hands in hands with uh, with people learning how to. Um, uh, read, of course, but that just increases the people um, who got access to knowledge 
many, many, many fold. And this is an example of United Kingdom, you know, in huge increase of data. So that's basically an increase in the data information and knowledge. We'll talk about those three concepts there. And the scale of challenge only going to increase. Just can't imagine how uh, the overall data volume uploaded into uh, internet increased from you know, less than one zettabyte to a 40 in, in 2020. And this all the data that's sort of uploaded on different websites every day, uh, each day 2.5 quintillion bytes of data are being created. And, you know, they're all stored somewhere on service or on the clouds. And, you know, it is an enormous amount of volume. Now, some of this is not very useful. Maybe some of it will never be used again, but some of it is used to gather the information and uh, produce knowledge. So just the amount of human knowledge increasing. But how do you create it now? Um, it's so much of it, yeah. And, you know, there we have a little bit of a problem. We're not machines, although we're creating beautiful machines, like, you know, the artificial intelligence is a great example of what can be achieved. But we're not such a great, we are, you know, we're kind of, I think uh, people say that we're a computer, but we're not uh, like a computer that works from, tops down, you know, it is basically a very much a, a complex um, computer interwoven with emotions. And we think with these two processes, I think the book by uh, Daniel Kahneman, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, it's a beautiful example of uh, this, this you know, description of the way uh, human cognition works and many other works as well I'll touch on in this class. But, you know, we think with two uh, systems, system one and two, and system one is basically our instinctive thinking. It's the engine of jumping to conclusions. It is our survival mechanism. You can imagine that people were hiding in uh, savannah sometimes, say, 100,000 years ago, and you know, it would be no good to you to apply your critical thinking uh, skills uh, slowly. What you had to do is to uh, act on uh, your instinct and intuition. And if you see something moving, and if you see uh, uh, something moving towards you uh, behind bushes and maybe a little sound, he said, well, you know, it might be a tiger, so I'll better run. It may not be nothing, but it may be safe to run. So it's basically your uh, very, very important one. And it's still with us. System two, though, requires effort, logical thinking. It is more effortful. The animals don't have it or very little of it, but we do uh, a, a capacity for abstract uh, thought and capacity to uh, seek patterns and based on those patterns and uh, you know create information from data is uh, ours but it's really very difficult we all prefer to think with system one it's our default choice and it just costs a lot more mental energy you know that's great but the world is even more complex than it was at the time of savannah and uh, you know our ancestors in african plain the world is unpredictable this year alone it's grown even more so say with coronavirus you know the in business world they call it VUCA world which is volatile uncertain complex and ambiguous and uh, changes here you know cure a lot more frequently and continues it's continuously and um, it's a lot more complex. You can just can imagine how many interdependent factors play their role. Um, we're also not able to predict many things. I mean, we were probably uh, not able to do it before, but now in just getting to the core of anything, it is incredibly difficult just to witness uh, a search for a coronavirus cure. And, you know, it is amazing what people do today, but it is not easy and it's also quite ambiguous with so much information with so much just think about all these fake news and 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 uh things that are happening it's not really easy to to discern what is right or what is not yeah and ambiguity and interpretation it's not going to disappear in fact it'll be harder and harder in the future to understand what is a fact and what is not and see here, here where you come in and say well okay you know how do I apply my critical thinking skills to separate facts 
from non facts or at least try to how do you make a coherent picture of the world i have to tell you it's not the only way you can think you know critical thinking it's just one tool in our arsenal we are much more complex beings than just uh thinking machines yeah yeah we you know if if you're so inclined i'd say you're probably uh heavenly beings yeah and and you know we have entitled so much more but you know in critical thinking is probably the um only way for you to structure your thoughts in some coherent matter or narrative that you can deliver to others and it's really just about anal analyzing facts and and to form some sort of a judgment and you'd include your unbiased analysis of an evalu evaluation of factual evidence we're the only animals to do it in essence it's just about having good reasons for your beliefs and helping us to find the best explanation of reality you can find you may not choose to have good reasons you know it's your your choice but you know if you do then you just have to think this way in critical uh to do it in science and business and anywhere where the uh, critical decisions around the society are made uh, it helps you believe to form beliefs when you have to, you know, uh, and, and, and then you just come back to them. You know, there's a, a little bit of a vocabulary that you must be able to know, and I think we'll touch on that. And facts versus opinion what are the assumptions, assertions, opinions, explanations, and um, you know, how do you form uh, these? Let's skip this example and go a little bit uh, into the learning. So, and I'll, I think we'll touch that uh, on, on the data side, but actually uh, this is a tool that's used in educational psychology quite a lot. And, and Bloom's taxonomy is really a, this triangle here that, uh, created by uh, Benjamin Bloom. It's quite used sometimes some time ago. It's a kind of classification of learning outcomes. Uh, but what you do is say, well, you know, um, at most what we can do in the beginning, is uh, or at least the lower thing that we can do is remembering things and you remember and basically uh, that's where you kind of wrote a learning comes and help you and you know try to understand what you've remembered now you could just sort of you know remember without understanding but then you understand and you can act at this stage like a sponge you just gather information uh analyze data and they just gather information don't analyze sorry just gather now you're still like a machine here then you start applying the knowledge so you have to carry out and execute some of the tasks that you've learned and then you analyze it you start structuring your knowledge making the information into the knowledge when you structure it then eventually you evaluate you start forming hypotheses you critique you judge your knowledge and that's where your critical things apply and you start asking questions you know what what do i have to know so what what's next why do i well why do i know that you know why is it you know how is it what if something different created and so this is the stage when you've selected the nuggets of information you know you're kind of panning for gold here and you ended up with a product that is uniquely your own and then you create something from there then you can give others now you finally have this mental product that you've gathered and you learned and then you evaluate it and create it I mean, it's just a, a very good thing uh, to to remember Bloom's taxonomy. I'm sure, we'll come back to that. Um, but if you come back to you know what is factual evidence, you need to know what is fact. Can you know what is fact? Well, not easy. Facts are things that are known and proven to be true, and information used in evidence or as part of a report or you know just taken somewhere. Hmm, is that is that a good definition of a fact? Can you always know the fact is true? Well, unless you witnessed it yourself, then you don't know if it is true, then you have to believe others. And you, know, you can make an investigation, which is why a fact can be proved or disproved, you know, if you investigate it. Now, you can't investigate everything, but it is really uh, a distinguishment of fact. The opinion, on the other hand, which is 
cannot be proved or disproved because the opinion is a view, judgment formed about something. It's not necessarily based on the fact or a knowledge. It's just an opinion you have. You may have that opinion because of your beliefs. You may have it because of incomplete knowledge, but it's not really a fact, right? And people always confuse facts and opinions. And discerning facts from opinions is not easy because uh, they will be always stated as an opinion, sometimes assertively so. And if it's an assertion, then it's a confident and forceful statement. You think that confidence means that the person is in possession of the facts, but no. And of course, you'll have to avoid emotional responses and all of it, but can you? No, not easy. And so you will always be in this world here where opinions are presented as facts and you would have to go back to the you know, tools of critical thinking. We'll cover this in the later chats. So a little bit on the, you know, okay, so what is the assumption? A assumption is something that you accept as true, as certain to happen, but it doesn't have to have a proof for it. It's just an assumption that you hold. It's kind of assumptions you hold and you express it as an opinion. And then you'll say, you know, uh, you evaluate these assumptions. You learn whether or not true or not. You know, what are your ideas that support it? What information do you have about it? And um, then you put forward your arguments. You know, if you have an assumption, you say, well, you know, my argument. And then we'll, we'll talk about what the arguments are, which are basically a reason set of support of some idea or action that you want to make. Uh, and then in the later parts, we'll describe these in more detail, uh, including what is the premise of the argument, how the argument works, you know, what are the valid or non-valid arguments. And I think it's just sort of, a, uh, hopefully we'll deliver that in, in the next uh, uh, part when I get to it. Then what are the barriers to critical thinking? Well, first of all, it's the world itself is probably a barrier. And, you know, it's just so hard to understand and get the facts from fiction straight. I'm going to always reiterate that. In many places, people don't do it. It looks like where well, you've listened to the class and it's like, okay, you know, I've got my skills and I'm going to go and apply them. It's so easy. Well, it is not. But I mean, I think no, knowing at least half the battle, yeah. And you're, the worst is that your thoughts are not entirely your own, yeah? So if you're, imagine now we are wired very differently than, animal, than, than computers, right? So we're a very unique computer. Our rational brain is actually a, you know, cover on top of more ancient structured brain that we uh, received uh, from our um, ancestors and you know sort of the most primitive one is what's called the reptilian brain it's very much a simplification here but you know you can imagine that's your instinctual brain this is where your first in you know uh, uh, limbic response well first pre-limbic responses are yeah it's basically an initial kind of your 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 quick responses fight or flight and you know everything instinctual i mean you can't fight that i mean that's where we are uh, you know we are not separate from animals here. And then we have emotions or feelings and they come to us from our uh, mammalian ancestors. And uh, it's also quite an important one. So the emotional thinking and instinctual thinking, you can't get rid of. Yeah, I mean, this all probably deep of your unconscious is, is very much part of you. And now the question is, which one of those three elements work on your thoughts is very difficult. Yeah. I mean, you can't be you without all of them working together. But, you know, for uh, you have to try to separate them, uh, but never have them fight each other, for sure. That's part of your personal development. But, you know, your emotional thinking will, will, will make it harder for you to think clearly. Uh, instinctual thinking, which will touch about the biases and, you know, system one. And um, you also have you know, some other problems of your personality, which is you've got personal fears and anxieties. You also have egocentrism or narcissism. You'll have a self-centered thinking that will prevent you from, you know, uh, judging facts carefully. So, or you will wish for something that it doesn't exist. Now, can you always win others of thinking critically? Well, I mean, thinking critically, how about, but winning? 
no, no, no. I mean, you will, I mean, it's completely different, but I mean, you will have to understand that this is only part of what you could do. It's not the only way to knowledge as well, but it is the only way to coherently describe the reality in front of you in put in a narrative. So turn these barriers into opportunity, try to integrate them all together. And so the question then, what is the uh, trait of critical thinker? Well, you always ask questions, that's for sure. You are open-minded, you know, honest with yourself and willing to admit that you're wrong. You courage to take initiative, you go forward. And you also have to find, and that's sort of part of your personal development, you know, control your fears, anxieties, or angers, and it's not easy again, you know. You'll have to be able to confront problems and you'll have to be aware of your biases and prejudices. You can't get rid of them, but you are have to be you have to be aware and uh, you'll have to be willing to argue. So you have to ask yourself questions, you know, uh, why do I believe in something? What are the potential problems with this? You know, how evaluate arguments that come from the other side and, you know, um, think that the information comes to you reasonable or not. I mean, there are three, uh, four elements here, which is sort of autonomy, independence, curiosity and you are your type of person have to ask questions are you you know uh, humility that you might be wrong and then you obviously have to respect uh, good reasoning but we don't do that that sometimes so there is another uh, good example I don't know who in invented this uh, I think it's been 30 40 years since it's been used in educational psychology called ladder of inference and um, you know, this happens to us a lot, you know. So this kind of a symbolic schematic here shows how we infer things from the observable data, yeah. So you get some pool of the of data. And when you gather information, imagine yourself as faulty, you know, and you gather some observations and you select from observations. Um, an example, use, for example, you know, somebody, uh, you present, you made a presentation and somebody didn't listen to you. He showed disinterest and he was working uh, on his computer or uh, watching his mobile. If you had repeated pattern there, or maybe he didn't show up to a meeting after he didn't listen to you. you know? So you start uh, selecting from that observation and then you're very quick to jump to conclusions. It's no normal nature, right? So you will have given meanings to that. And meanings to this might be in this uh, specific case, something that, you know, he is uh, hostile to me. He doesn't uh, like me, so he ignores my presentations and maybe he has personal grudge against me. And, you know, then you start actually making those assumptions uh, uh, very clear and they solidify into conclusions. And then you, that's then very quickly goes into the beliefs, you know, and you're up what they call you're up on the ladder and so you adopt beliefs. And then in that result, for example, that could be a, an action. So you start you know, avoiding that person or if it's your subordinate, you actually don't give him tasks. And you know, it's quite interesting and you've jumped on the conclusions far too quickly you know, without evaluating all the data. So our beliefs will affect the data you will uh, select next time. And then that will also be a, a um, something that you have now formed a bias. Yeah, very easy. It's so easy to form a bias this way. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I can give you uh, many other examples, but this is just a wonderful uh, picture here of how we climb things too uh, up, far up and, uh, you know, don't get enough time to look at the observations. Don't go and observe the data. And that's sort of where, um, you know, uh, we make mistakes, yeah. But now I told you a little bit about data, information, so, but what are, the, what are these, yeah? And I think I use the same pyramid here to actually tell you about similar, uh, uh, similar things here. And, uh, but it's just, a, it's in showing in a different way. So data, well, data is something which is basically initial digits or uh, facts, figures, anything that is disorganized, you know, uh, you know, random 
you know sets of digits and that you've received and you know they they are basically things that await knowing uh processing verifications it tells you nothing really about the meaning of this i mean it doesn't have meaning it's a data I and mean, the only way for data to have meaning is for you to um, get it through so that's sort of a first step you know you gather the data the information on the other hand is something that has been collected think about it as the um uh news you know news article versus just a random words or think about it as the excel table versus uh you know uh numbers that have been organized into a table yeah so that's the data and once it's organized it's information it's structured processed and put in a context now it doesn't have meaning yet because it you didn't really interpret it yet yeah so it, it doesn't so you'll have to give a meaning and then in order to do that you will have to verify the data or the information in that case so the information is received but there's a lot of information you structure it and you start verifying analyzing uh, and understand the believability of that data select what is right and uh, remove what is not and try to form a picture you also look at the transparency make sure that that information has transparent sources so honest and clear demonstration of that process that you've just went through and also recognizing the limitation is important once all these steps are done you are on the path to knowledge and the knowledge is the information has been verified and it's transparent and then based on that you can assume that this sort of uh, best describes the reality that you're in and it could be a, a base for uh, future wise decisions it also has to be narrated into, into logical coherent story for you to understand it and for others to be explained to when this knowledge is assembled and if you've done it many times you qualify that into decisions and you also qualify that into wisdom so wisdom is uh, basically a main much knowledge that has been accumulated as a result of experience and transferred to action that's how i would judge what a knowledge is now we're still not there in the action you know domain yeah so how do you go with the action is and i think we'll, we'll touch on that there well i think you've you understood what the you know the difference between data and uh, information and knowledge so you'll have to say well why do i need to do anything well i mean ask questions what what you know you need to establish a need for solution if there is a problem you need to have a solution but what is the need for that what is the desired outcome you know why is what is not working here you have to ask this to yourself and then ask so what what makes this thing important why are you doing it you know who does it impact what are the benefits of this thing and how significant is the issue to analyze and then you ask no now what and that sort of contextualize the problems you know have you tried it what others have tried it what are the constraints that exist so you kind of do it in a loop here you know for uh, any problem at hand when we talk about problem solving we'll 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 touch on that as well and then you write the problem statement you break your problem into several smaller problems and make the statement as specific as you can and you also have to think about how the success will look like so that's uh, when you transform your thoughts and critical thinking into action. Critical thinking will help you to identify the problem and also help you to uh, uh, create this, um, not create, but you'll have to analyze the gap and form future solutions and predict things. And I'd like to finish today on this slide, which is really about making predictions. You know, I, in my job, do make predictions, but they are very difficult because, you know, generally predicting things uh, are, is not easy. So it's where our objective and subjective realities intersect. So just think about, you know, uh, various kinds of um, matrices where people put it together. Objective things are when there is an observation of measurable facts and balanced view it's a scientific thinking 
subjective is you get personal opinions, assumptions, interpretations, and beliefs. You climb up the ladder, you know, you get, and you have to come back again. You have to climb up the ladder and come back again. And uh, subjectivity means that we're making predictions. We are really influenced by natural biases. So you have to be aware of that. So we're not fully objective. And uh, none of us is, but there are also things like known unknowns and unknown unknowns that we'll touch on later. And you know, how do you predict that? Though, you know, I think we'll we'll, we'll uh, see if what what's the best way forward. Is it uh, something around probability, or is it something about narratives? And we'll talk about that as well. So you can't escape and eliminate these complexities, but you have to use critical thinking and learn from your experiences to think creatively. And with that, i will like to finish and uh, invite you for a next chat. And I hope we'll uh, talk about human thinking in the world next time. Cheers. Till next week. Bye.